Hey guys, welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to discuss hydatiform moles, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, and hyperemesis gravidarum. Let's start by differentiating first and foremost the two different types of molar pregnancies that we need to know. So molar pregnancies can be either complete or incomplete, and they can be identified by some unique characteristics. So sperm fertilization of an empty egg results in a complete molar pregnancy. Characteristics of a complete molar pregnancy include a lack of embryo or fetal components. As well, you will find diffuse trophoblastic hyperplasia and diffuse hydatiform swelling of the chorionic villi. The karyotype here will be 46XX or 46XY. And because the egg was empty during fertilization, all the chromosomes present in the complete molar pregnancy are going to be from the father. Now, the risk of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is actually higher in a complete molar pregnancy with up to 1 in 5 becoming neoplastic. The other, time of, the other type, of course, is our partial molar pregnancy. Now, this occurs when a normal egg is fertilized by two sperm. So what's going to happen here is there will be the presence of embryo and fetal components as well as hydatiform swelling of the chorionic villi and trophoblastic hyperplasia, but both the swelling and the hyperplasia will be focal rather than diffuse as you'd see with the complete mole. Now there, all, there will also be scalloping of chorionic villi and trophoblastic stromal inclusions in the partial mole, which won't be present in the complete mole. Now immunohistochemistry will be p57 positive in the partial mole and as far as karyotyping goes, it's going to be either 69XXY, 69XYY, or 69XXX. And the risk of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia in this type is much lower as compared to the complete, with only around 1 in 20 or less resulting in gestational trophoblastic neoplasia as a result of the partial molar pregnancy. Now, let's move on and discuss some of the signs and symptoms of the hydatiform mole as a whole. Now, many of the signs and symptoms can mimic signs and symptoms of pregnancy, such as a missed period, a positive pregnancy test. But early on in the disease, many will report pelvic pain, fullness, or pressure, may even also have an enlarged uterus on exam. Now, in many cases, the uterine size is going to be significantly larger than the estimated gestational age for the patient, which is a big um, sort of a big buzzword or a big buzz statement you want to look for in your vignette. Vaginal bleeding can also occur as the molar villi begins to separate from the underlying decidua. Patients can also develop nausea and vomiting as they develop hyperemesis gravidarum as a result of the molar pregnancy. And we'll talk about this condition a little bit more, but keep in mind that they are associated. Now, late in the molar pregnancy, there are even more findings that can be present, and these include symptoms of hyperthyroidism like warmth, anxiety, palpitations, and tremor. Now, it's not entirely clear what causes these symptoms, but the hypothesis is that the beta HCG, HCG that's present at incredibly high levels in the late molar pregnancy acts as a thyroid stimulator because of the biological homology between beta HCG and TSH. Bilateral fecal lutein ovarian cysts arise additionally because of the hyperstimulation from these high beta HCG levels. And finally, preeclampsia usually occurs after 34 weeks gestational age. So if you see preeclampsia before the, week, the 20th week gestation, you should think about a complete molar pregnancy. Now in terms of labs, the most important lab you want to remember here is that the hydatiform moles will produce a serum HCG level that is elevated for gestational age, oftentimes extremely, extremely high. The imaging modality of choice is going to be, of course, a transvaginal ultrasound. And in a complete molar pregnancy, like we went over earlier, there's going to be a lack of embryo or fetal components. There will be no amniotic fluid. And the ultrasound will have that classic snowstorm appearance. The complete molar pregnancy may also present with ovarian theca lutein cysts. Then in partial molar pregnancy, we can see embryo or fetal components, the presence of a small amount of amniotic fluid, a placenta with that Swiss cheese pattern, and or increased echogenicity of chorionic villi. Now to make your diagnosis of a hydatiform mole, a tissue sample will be obtained and the histology will be examined. Treatment will include dilation as well as suction aspiration and curatage. Now with the tissue, with the tissue sample obtained, a distinction of partial versus complete mole can definitively be made and we'll do that using karyotyping. Serial HCG level monitoring after curatage will also be performed with the goal of assessing for the presence of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. Let's move on now to gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. As we went over in the last few slides, this can follow a hydatiform mole, but it could also follow choriocarcinoma. It could also follow epithelioid trophoblastic tumor or placental site trophoblastic tumors. 
that both hydatiform walls and choriocarcinoma histology will be, will, will be found with elevated HCG, but placental site trophoblastic tumors and epithelioid trophoblastic tumors will have low levels of HCG. So that's a very easy way for you to differentiate between the two. Now, signs and symptoms of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia are very similar to those of a molar pregnancy, like we went over in the previous slides. This includes things like pelvic pain and pressure, vaginal bleeding, nausea, vomiting, hyperthyroidism, ovarian thecolutein cysts, and rarely preeclampsia, which would occur, remember, before 20 weeks gestation. Now, you get some additional symptoms depending on the sites of metastasis. By far, the most common site of metastasis here is in the lungs. Now, when you think of metastasis of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia, you should immediately think of the lungs. After the lungs, the next most common sites are the vagina, CNS, and the liver. All right, let's go over some of the symptoms that you might see with metastasis to these different parts of the body. So if we see metastasis to the lungs, you might expect to see chest pain, dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis, and or respiratory failure. So, you know, the same thing you would expect with other um, types of lung cancer. Now, if we have metastasis to the vagina, there may be vaginal bleeding. There may also be purulent discharge. Now, CNS metastasis signs and symptoms include those that are consistent with increased in, uh, intracranial pressure or an intracerebral hemorrhage. So you might see dizziness, nausea, headache, neuropathy, visual disturbances, slurred speech, and or hemiparesis. Now, most often, patients with, with metastasis to the liver will be asymptomatic, but some cases may develop jaundice, abdominal pain, even back pain. Now, there's a variety of lab abnormalities that you might see in a patient with gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. It depends mostly on the tissue origin of the neoplasia, how large it's grown, and if there, of course, is any METs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia that arises from an invasive mole or choriocarcinoma can have elevated levels of HCG. Now, if these levels get really, really high, they can cause hyperthyroidism. So what are we going to do at that point? A thyroid function test. Additionally, ALT and AST levels can be elevated if the neoplasia has metastasized to the liver. The imaging modality of choice for gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is a pelvic ultrasound. Now, gestational trophoblastic neoplasia that's derived from an invasive mole will appear as a poorly defined uterine mass with anechoic areas with possible invasion into the myometrium. Choriocarcinoma appears as a heterogeneous uterine mass because of necrosis and hemorrhage, and there may be invasion into the parametrium. Now, placental site trophoblastic tumors appear as a hyperechoic intrauterine mass, possibly with cystic and solid components, and they usually invade the myometrial wall. And finally, epithelioid trophoblastic tumors are most often solitary nodules with sharp margins. Now, patients should also have a chest x-ray performed because remember, we want to assess for the potential of metastasis, which is most likely to go where? To the lungs. All right, now when it comes to diagnosing this, unlike most solid tumors, Tissue is not actually required here to make a diagnosis, but treatment is initiated based on symptoms, labs, and imaging. Now, after a patient has a molar pregnancy, they're going to be monitored with weekly HCG levels, and if it's found that levels plateau over a three-week period or HCG levels increase over 10% with three separate values over a two-week period, the diagnosis of gestational trophoblastic neoplasia is made. This is the only diagnosis that can produce these HCG findings, so a tissue biopsy simply isn't necessary. Now, there's a lot of complicated scoring systems that are used to stage and categorize these gestational trophoblastic neoplasias as low risk, high risk, and it's not really worth memorizing those nitty gritty details, but I would say you can safely bet that if the neoplasia is confined to the uterus and is smaller in size without metastasis, we consider that low risk. While a bigger tumor with more distant metastasis and with more numerous sites of metastasis with a higher number of METs and or if the patient previously failed single agent chemo, these are all signs that the neoplasia is high risk and a more intensive chemotherapy regimen would be warranted. So for low risk choriocarcinoma or low risk invasive moles, the treatment would be methotrexate and monitoring for up to a year with serial serum HCG tests to assess for reoccurrence. Okay. And for low-risk stage 1 placental site trophoblastic tumors or epithelioid trophoblastic tumors, no chemo is needed, but hysterectomy, uh, hysterectomy is warranted. Now, high-risk choriocarcinomas or invasive moles should be treated with a combination of atopicide, methotrexate, actinomycin D, and alternating cyclophosphamide and vincristine, depending on which cycle of chemo the patient's being administered. And finally, high-risk placental site trophoblastic tumors or epithelioid trophoblastic tumors get a chemo regimen 
plus hysterectomy. All right, and the final topic we're going to talk about here is hyperemesis gravidarum. This is a condition of pregnancy that's characterized by severe nausea and vomiting that can be accompanied by weight loss and dehydration. This is going to result in lightheadedness as well as other signs of volume depletion. Now, molar pregnancy is one risk factor for the development of hyperemesis gravidarum. However, multiple gestations and first pregnancy are also thought to be risk factors. Now, it's hypothesized that the high level of HCG and estrogen are going to be the causes of hyperemesis gravidarum. So this makes sense why molar pregnancies or even multiple gestations put a patient at an increased risk. Now, the lab abnormalities you'll see here are due to the vomiting, the dehydration, as well as a lack of caloric intake associated with the condition. So the patient can develop a hypokalemic and hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis as a result of the vomiting. From not getting sufficient caloric intake, the patient can have ketosis. They could also have hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia as a result of insufficient intake. Now, the dehydration can lead to an increase in hematocrit. And remember, there's usually a physiologic anemia of pregnancy with a greater plasma volume compared to red blood cell mass. So even if the hematocrit is in the normal range for a non-pregnant patient, it can represent dehydration and hemoconcentration. The dehydration could also result in elevated BUN and elevated urine-specific gravity. And finally, liver transaminases may be slightly elevated, with ALT usually slightly more elevated than AST. If not previously performed as part of the pregnancy workup, a pelvic ultrasound should be performed at this point to evaluate for gestational trophoblastic disease or multiple gestation. Now, the diagnosis is made when in the first trimester, the patient has persistent vomiting, weight loss of more than 5% of pre-pregnancy weight plus ketonuria, and there is no other identifiable cause for these symptoms. Once all that is present, we can make our diagnosis. Treatment is going to include trying to eat small bland meals that are spaced out throughout the day. Although this does have very limited benefits, it's still something we recommend. Now the medication pure doxing, doxylamine succinate is usually warranted. And if the patient is significantly dehydrated and they're unable to replace fluids on their own as a result of the persistent vomiting, then we're going to need to give them IV fluid replacement plus thiamine. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here's your first question. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button. And then once you've got it, come on back. Correct answer here is C. Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. Once you got it, come on back. Correct answer here is A. And your final question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is A. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one. Thank you.